think the effort was there. I just don't think the concentration to close the 48 minutes is there yet, which is unfortunate. Counting the hours until March is over? No. I'm never one to shortcut the process. It's all part of the process. That's what I live by. That's why that's I built my career. So, you know, tomorrow's another day. It's another opportunity, but we got some, we got some work to do. And we don't have a lot of time. Yeah. We got London on the track. This is all track. guys doing, man. You can't plan it. But if the devil's in the details, then I'm satanic. Well, it's official. The Cleveland Cavaliers are in serious trouble. While for most of the season, everybody and their grandmother was convinced the team led by LeBron would breeze into the NBA Finals for a seventh consecutive season, the recent play of the Cavs had made this once assured conclusion highly questionable. So what is good? People's kid, how we doing? It's your boy Kobe back from another video, and as always, I hope you guys are having a blessed day. As you can assume from the video, today I'm going to talk about the five biggest changes the Cavaliers need to make in order to vote a scenario in which they not only fail to win the NBA title, but fail to even make it to the NBA Finals. And yes, it has gotten to that point. But before before getting there, let's quickly discuss why this season is so much different from other LeBron-led teams in years past. First of all, the most obvious concern is that we have never seen so much losing at this point in the season from the Cavs as we have this year, as they finished March with a paltry 7-10 record. In comparison to the other March win-loss record from the six previous years in which LeBron reached the NBA Finals, it is clear each team was much farther along in regards to their winning ways. Now, to be fair, there are a couple seasons listed here in which the difference in record only results in a handful of games, small enough to argue this discrepancy is not particularly significant. Yet what is significant and remains at the root of the Cavs' problem is their team defense falling off a cliff since the All-Star break. Unlike the common theme of seeing past LeBron teams evolve to very good defensive squads by the end of the regular season, this year has worked in reverse. Following the All-Star break, the Cavs ranked near the bottom of the NBA in nearly all defensive metrics, highlighted by a defensive rating that puts them at second worst in the entire NBA. So with that being said, it's now or never for the Cavs. And guys, without further ado, here are the five things they need to do to save their season. Number five, bench Darren Williams immediately. You really have to understand LeBron's role as general manager to appreciate this one. Now, if you guys remember a few short months ago, when the Cavs were going through another rough stretch in the month of January, LeBron called on David Griffin to make a move to sign a quote bleeping playmaker. And to David Griffin's credit, he did exactly that, signing Darren Williams after being weighed by the Dallas Mavericks. Before joining the Cavs, Williams carried modest averages of 13.1 points per game and 6.9 assists per game in 40 games for Dallas. At the time, it seemed like a perfect move for Cleveland to find a guy to help regulate the minutes of LeBron and Kyrie through the drag of the regular season. But what most didn't anticipate was Williams' negative impact he would have on the defensive side of the ball. Despite having some good moments here and there, Darren has unfortunately been exposed by opposing guards defensively every night he takes the court. In his 16 games of the Cavaliers thus far, Williams has posted a defensive box plus minus score of negative 2.4. Beyond the support of this statistic, however, the eye test does the trick here as Darren is just unplayable for defensive purposes in the Cavs' current state. On the ball, he is far too slow to cover guys that can blow by him more often than not, and off the ball, he often loses track of his man, resulting in wide open shot opportunities for the other team. And look, at this point in the season, it is perfectly fine to let Williams roll diminish. Darren's purpose for this year was not meant for the playoffs when rotations would inevitably cut down to seven or eight guys. His purpose was meant for the regular season. So in realizing at full strength the Cavs will commit to players like Kyle Korver, J.R. Smith, Iman Chumpert, Shannon Fry, and Richard Jefferson before Darren, it is time to cut him out of the rotation to allow for the very best lineups to gel. I understand he's a veteran guy that has playoff experience to hang his head on, but he's doing more harm than good for this Cavs bunch right now that will need more oomph on the defensive side than he can provide. I hate to say it because I've always been a fan of his game, but this is the right move. Hopefully Ty Lue realized this and makes the appropriate changes. Number 4. Bringing back Kevin Love to all-star status. In the month of March, the big three of the Cavaliers has looked more like the big two, and what makes this increasingly scary for the Cavs is that both Kyrie and LeBron are having some of their best statistical seasons as a pro, and they're still losing. For Kyrie, this is clearly his best year in the NBA, as he's finally been able to translate his elite scoring to the golden benchmark of 25 points per game, while LeBron is shooting a ridiculous 54% from the field. Thus, when there's not much more you can ask from your top guys, it's time to take a look at the other guy you know can play better. Ironically, for the first half of the season, Love was truly playing at an all-star level, which I believe was a testament to his improved ability to shoot off the catch at a much faster rate and also the natural progression of him becoming more familiar with the players around him. At the height of his success this season in December, Love posted a usage rate at 28.3% on 22.7 points per game and 10.8 rebounds per game. Yet since this month that was undoubtedly his best stretch with Cleveland, 
he has seen his usage rate drop nearly 4% up to this past month in March. Now, Kevin did miss a part of the year as a result of knee surgery around mid-February, but this doesn't excuse the fact for his massive drop in usage rate for the month of January. Whether Cavs fans like to admit it or not, there's little doubt the production of Love has a profound effect on Cleveland's overall ability to win. In Cavs wins this season, Love is averaging 20.9 points per game and 11.2 rebounds per game on 44% from the field and 40% from three. In losses, this drops dramatically to only 15.2 points per game and 10.2 rebounds a contest on a subpar 38.8% from the field and 33% from three. You see, when all is going well, what Kevin does so well for this team is essentially take the pressure off Irving and LeBron in the first quarter and first half of the game. In doing so, it allows Cleveland to maintain a competitive advantage for Kyrie and Braun to conserve their energy for more consequential moments later on. Another massive point of consideration is his need to regain his shooting stroke to where it was at the middle of the season. As he's shooting only 30% from three since his return from injury, further slumping will be a recipe for disaster for the Cavs come playoff time. In fact, it is no secret Cleveland will need all spot-up shooters to improve their production as well. Quite honestly, J.R. Smith has a strong case for the absolute worst starting player on a playoff team with the way he's been playing lately. It's one thing to be struggling with your shot upon reappearing in the lineup, but it's another thing to not play with consistent defensive effort at such a crucial position for your team. But before he hijacks this video on his own, let's look for K-Love to return to all-star status. It is of utmost importance. Number 3. More minutes for Derek Williams or DeAndre Liggins in a perfect world, I would love to see minutes given to both these guys, but beggars can't be choosers so I'm okay with either one. When you consider the way in which the Cavs teams in years past were able to succeed and reach the NBA Finals, there is a common denominator that is still too often overlooked in the eyes of coaches and management league-wide. Without a doubt, the ability to add grit and toughness to your lineup can prove to be invaluable at the most pivotal times. In particular, let me take you guys back to the 2015 NBA Finals, in which the mighty Golden State Warriors competed against the Kyrie and K-Loveless Cavaliers squad that boasts a lineup of LeBron James, Iman Shumpert, Matthew Della Vadova, Timofey Mozgov, and Tristan Thompson. But despite arguably one of the most imbalanced matchups in the NBA Finals in recent memory, the Cavs willed their way to wins in both Game 2 and Game 3 of that series off sheer toughness. Say what you want about Matthew Della Vadova and his perceived limited skills, but that guy is one of the toughest SOBs in the NBA and he matched Stephen Curry off pure grit, period. And that's what the Cavs need right now. Along with a guy like Tristan Thompson, Derek Williams or DeAndre Liggins are guys that can not only improve the defensive woes, but it can also help change the character of this team. I admit, it's a great luxury to have guys like Kyle Korver and Channing Frye who can single-handedly win you ball games off their three-point shooting, but you can't underestimate the importance of having players who can grind out close ball games with their energy and hustle. Now, in regards to Derek Williams, I realize he's been a bit of a wild card in his NBA career so far, yet it's fair to point out he has had some successful moments this season. In truth though, if I had to choose one guy the Cavs need to at least do their due diligence on, it's DeAndre Liggins and it's not even close. While it may seem like it was a decade ago, just over three short months ago, Liggins played a valuable role in holding down the fort while J.R. Smith was out by doing his job as a 3 and D type of player. For those that remember the Christmas game against the Warriors, much of that win had to do with Liggins playing outstanding defense on Curry, picking him up full court at every turn. That's the toughness they need. Granted, his three-point prowess is not even close to some of the other guys on the roster. It's still crazy to diminish his impact on the defensive side of the floor. If you don't believe me, take a look at this. When looking at the top five-man lineups in terms of plus-minus for the Cavaliers this season, Liggins finds himself the number one successful lineup alongside LeBron James, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Love, and Tristan Thompson at an overall plus of 117. The next highest lineup sits at a plus-minus of plus 39. So I know it's a lot to ask when you consider the amount of wing players on the team already, but Liggins is the one player alongside Tristan Thompson that has consistently proven to bring the element of toughness so necessary in the deeper rounds of the NBA playoffs. If you give him the minutes, I just don't think he'd disappoint. Number 2. Slow down the pace. After the Cavs got beat down by the San Antonio Spurs by an embarrassing 29 points on Monday, head coach Ty Lue openly admitted that his team was looking quote, really slow out there. And yet while I don't disagree, his recognition makes it even more clear that the Cavaliers need to slow down the pace at which they are playing at. Over the last two seasons, Cleveland consistently ranked as one of the slowest teams in regards to the pace they played at, averaging only 95.9 possessions per game in the 2014-2015 season and 96.4 possessions last year. To some who think this is a bad thing, this is actually one of their major keys to success. With several of the best isolation players in the world, 
slowing down the pace to more of a half-court battle on both sides really works in the Cavs' favor to limit the powerhouse offenses of their opponents. So when we consider averaging a full three possessions more per game at 99.8 this year, this definitely raises some red flags. Although this doesn't seem like a significant amount, the fact that Cleveland is playing faster this season indicates several potential shortcomings. 1. It could show they are not able to dictate the pace of the game like they used to in years past. And 2. It possibly shows their willingness to get caught up in trying to outscore opponents in high scoring matchups. While this strategy may get them by in the Eastern Conference if they begin to start hitting shots, I guarantee you they will get run out of the building if they try to play this way against the Golden State Warriors and the San Antonio Spurs. The key to beat these teams is to shorten the game, make every possession count, and crash the glass for offensive boards in order to take off more clock and reset. That's why you often see LeBron and Kyrie switch off in isolation with the shot clock winding down throughout the second half of the game. Quite frankly, it's a very successful model. Having said this, in order for them to actually be able to slow down the game, they'll have to improve their performance on defense. If they can't get enough stops, then slowing down the pace will be incredibly difficult. Number 1. Enter Reckless LeBron I realize this is a very cliche thing to say as the last thing the Cavs need to do to save their season, but recognize that come playoff time, LeBron is simply a different player. The reason you gave LeBron rest in the regular season is for him to go ham for the two months in the postseason. So while LeBron carries all the sexy statistics and efficiency in the regular season, all that goes out the window when competing for an NBA title. Credit to him, he has managed to get his field goal percentage to one of the highest numbers of his career this season. But in my opinion, LeBron is at his very best when he doesn't focus on his efficiency and simply goes super saiyan on his usage rate. Because a lot of times in the NBA playoff games where say LeBron takes 30 shots and makes only 11 or 12 of them are the same games where the Cavs brilliantly control the pace and turn the game into a half court battle. In other words, LeBron's impact is most felt at times with a slow and methodical game plan aligns with his increased volume shooting and decision making. This isn't to say he's not great in his current regular season form, actually in fact he's still the best player in the league right now, but the LeBron who challenged Golden State in 2015 and defeated them in 2016 did it by out grinding and outwilling the other team. Quite frankly, reckless LeBron is desperate LeBron, and that desperation fuels his ability to perform at levels that we've never seen before in the postseason. That is why, for all the fear that Cleveland fans are justly worried about with this team, there is still a lot to be confident about. If the Cavs can adjust their plan with any of these five strategies, the rebound is quite possible. So as Yogi Berra once said, it ain't over till it's over. For LeBron and the Cavs, this year's journey has just begun. So there you guys have it, the five changes that I think the Cleveland Cavaliers need to do to save their season. I think the number one thing they have to focus on right now is figuring out their defense. In order to do that, they need to start playing guys that are in the NBA because of their defense. I love Darren Williams, but sometimes when you have too many veterans playing, you lose some of that defensive edge that you can get by playing younger guys. That's why I think DeAndre Liggins is the perfect guy that can get some more grit into this Cavs lineup. Comment below what you guys think the Cavs need to do in order to save their season. If you guys are Cavs fans or just general NBA fans, I'd love to hear what you guys think. So drop a comment down below as well. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, if you enjoyed it, please drop a like down below. Subscribe if you like basketball videos. We do a ton of basketball videos and we're going to be turning them out once a week on this channel on Sunday nights. Also, as I mentioned last week, we are starting a new channel called TPK Daily. It is up and running now, and we've uploaded a couple videos, so if you guys want to go check that out, the link will be in the description. With that being said, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day, and I will catch you next week. Yeah.